Hello everyone and welcome to the Ballarat International Photo Biennale's Conversations Online series. For our last talk of this part of the series, um, and thank you for joining us in this conversation event, discussing the poverty line with artist Lynn, one half of Chow and Lynn, and Bernardo Tobias from Oz Harvest Australia. My name is Fiona Sweet, and I'm the Artistic Director and CEO of the Ballarat International Photo Biennale. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that the Biennale takes place on the land of the Wadarung and Jajawarung people, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. The Biennale would like to thank our lead partners, Spices, Bauhaus and Hanamula, and our major government partners, the City of Ballarat, Creative Victoria, Visit Victoria, and the Australian Government through the RISE Fund for their ongoing support. I'm so pleased to begin this conversation event discussing Chow and Lin's exhibition, The Poverty Line, at the 2021 Biennale, as well as the important work of Oz Harvest Australia with Bernardo Tobias the State Manager for Victoria and South Australia at Oz Harvest Australia. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. Chow and Lin are based in Beijing, China. Stephen Chow is a Malaysian-born, Singapore-raised visual artist, and Lin is an economist by training and is a market researcher. The crux of Chow and Lin's practice lies in their methodology of statistical, mathematical and computational techniques to address global is issues. Since 2009, through a typographical, no, typological and photographic approach, Chow and Lin's projects are driven by the discursive backgrounds in economics, public policy, media, and these are further augmented by enduring exchanges with specialists from these fields. Bernardo, with 16 years of food industry experience across three continents, Bernardo has seen firsthand the food waste generated at almost every stage of the supply chain. When an opportunity arose with leading food rescue organisation Oz Harvest, he made the shift to the not-for-profit sector, accepting a role as the food rescue driver in early 2017. Since then, he has quickly taken on increasing levels of responsibility and management in the organisation. This experience has been invaluable to his current role as the Victorian and South Australian State Manager at Oz Harvest. Bernardo is passionate about fighting food waste and helping those in need across the country. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Um, I think I might start off the conversation today with Lynn and actually ask Lynn just for our audiences to just give us a detailed overview of the project, perhaps how it started and how it was developed to what we see today here at the Biennale in Ballarat. Yes, thank you, certainly. Um, and now I'll share a short presentation uh, to explain about the project. Please let me know if you see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, so I'm Lin uh, Hui, and um, the Poverty Line Project uh, was a collaboration between Stefan Chow and myself. Um, as you heard, uh, we come from quite different backgrounds, um, and we started collaborating to do artwork. We are actually also a husband and wife uh, duo, so we, we communicate um, very much on a daily basis on concerns that we see uh, in, in the world around us. So why we started this project? Now, back in 2009, uh, we had uh, just moved over to Beijing um, from Singapore. Uh, and for us, um, being able to live in different places, um, traveling around uh, different countries, uh, we also uh, observed uh, the social structures and the issues that um, different countries were having uh, with economic progress. Uh, now, one of the issues that we uh, were, were quite um, uh, concerned about was about poverty and, and the social 
issues that, that come about um, in a fast growing economy like China or India, uh, as well as in developed economies like US and the Europe. Um, and as we observed um, uh, these different issues uh, in communities, uh, we, we also started questioning, what does it actually mean to be poor? And when we talk about it with, with our friends, um, uh, the, the idea about being poor becomes a very uh, amorphous one. I think people have different relative uh, ways of associating, understanding the concept. Now, from an economics background, uh, um, I, I wanted to really understand it more deeply. And so I did a lot of research. Uh, and um, for example, we look at World Bank, UN statistics, um, and these really refer to the concept of global extreme poverty, and therefore there's an inter international measure to it. Uh, but if you look in more in depth uh, and trying to contextualize what it means, uh, then we realize that actually national poverty lines and understanding the context of where uh, poor communities live and how the poor individuals and households interact uh, with their environments is actually very important. And so we started to focus on how countries define poverty in their own context. Um, so what we did was that we used the national poverty line statistics of each country, and then we divided it into a per person per day rate. Uh, and we used that, food, that amount of money to go out to the local markets and supermarkets to purchase food items. So for example, this was part of the first case study we developed in China back in 2010, where uh, per person per day, a, 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 a person living on the poverty line of China then would be able to uh, spend uh, 50 cents US, uh, have income of 50 cents US, and he would be able to get six plain buns. We also bought, purchased the local newspaper of the day, and we used that as a background. So um, after developing the China case study, we got actually a lot of different feedback, which made it very interesting because we realized that people from different countries uh, were seeing the work uh, in, their own, um, in, in their own perspective. And so we decided to bring this conversation and this uh, visualization um, to different countries. So for example, uh, we used the same methodology and the same uh, visual method um, in India. Uh, this was New Delhi in 2011. And we also brought it to developed countries. So for developing, uh, for developing economies, we use the po national poverty line divided per person per day. And for developed economies, um, which generally use a relative poverty measure, uh, which is more a measure of social inequality, uh, we also tried to account for the fact that in developed economies, um, a lot of the expenses, the, house, the household expenditure actually goes into non-food items. So uh, we did a slight um, change in the, math, in the calculations. Uh, we multiplied it by a factor of a typical low-income household expenditure on food and non-alcoholic beverage. And that is how we derived the food budget um, of, a of a person living at the poverty line of a developed economy. Mm. So for example, this was France, uh, Paris, in 2015. Uh, and that was amount of um, 6.73 US dollars for food. Uh, and this was USA uh, in 2019. Um, and that was 5.46 US dollars for food. Um, so uh, I think one of the interesting points that we also tried to incorporate into the project was to assemble a visual food basket of a country. Um, and uh, why we chose to do that was because um, we were very much inspired um, by two economists. Um, uh, if you, sorry, I think well, you can't really see this, but this is a book um, by two economists, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who are also Nobel laureates. Uh, and some of the research that they did in developing economies in poor communities uh, was about behavior by poor households and how they make decisions on daily purchases. Uh, and one of our key learnings was that um, if a poor person has a little bit more income in a day, um, he is just as irrational or irrational as all of us. And he may make a choice to buy something better, um, better proteins like fish uh, and, a, and a treat like sweets or chocolate for children uh, rather than buy more basic calories. 
And so we wanted to also present that there are choices uh, within the, the, the scope of the supermarkets, of the markets that poor people go to, but these choices may not become their eventual decision because of the limited budget. Um, but but it, it does become a very uh, restricting um, pressure uh, for to make that kind of a daily choice. Uh, and so, for example, this was Brazil that um, we, we assembled a food basket in 2012 uh, across different um, uh, food groups, um, carbohydrates, proteins, snacks, uh, and fruits and vegetables. And this was Australia um, in 2011, we went to Sydney. Uh, so interestingly for Australia, actually one of the learnings that we had when we visited the local markets and supermarkets, um, is that the quality of produce in Australia is really good. Uh, I think in terms of the agriculture um, systems in Australia, it's very developed. Um, the freshness, uh, the quality uh, of, of the food that you'll be able to purchase uh, in a local market um, is actually high comparatively to a lot of other countries. Um, we also, uh, in here, you would see, uh, we tried to um, also make sure that we cover some local, uh, very local uh, foods, for example, Tim Tams, um, carrots uh, that we know is also uh, exported uh, out to over other markets, um, tiger bread. I think these are some of the um, very common local foods that we also try to incorporate in our understanding of the local food culture uh, and, and diet. Um, so over the past 10 years, um, we have covered 36 countries and territories uh, using the methodology that we explained uh, across six continents. Um, and really, I think um, it has become, um, for, for me, an extended uh, study of understanding poverty, inequality, and also global food choices, uh, which really links us all together. Because um, I think now, nowadays, we're talking about uh, food production and trade uh, on a global level. And you'll see like the very interesting differences or similarities across different countries in the food culture, in consumption, in the hybrids that we choose to produce in crop or livestock. Uh, and, and this really uh, links us all together. Um, so initially we presented the works uh, in exhibitions um, and, and in large scale exhibitions. So in Ballarat, um, we, we are actually really happy that um, such a light, large range of uh, countries are actually featured uh, in the exhibition. And we hope uh, you know, it gives a, a good breadth um, of understanding the different countries' uh, situations. Um, this was an exhibition we did in Beijing in 2015. Um, and uh, the most recent one that we did before Ballarat was actually in France this year. Uh, where we chose to make a much larger size uh, prints uh, focusing on poultry. Uh, and uh, this was actually done outdoors because of COVID measures. Uh, and we also tried to build interdisciplinary platforms. Um, so I think for the for our content, we actually um, uh, started building up so um, from art and photography audiences, but also bringing to policy related economics, mm -hmm. uh, social work related audiences, uh, media and so on. So for example, here we're invited by the United Nations uh, Economic Social Committee for uh, Asia Pacific um, to, to uh, exhibit and explain about the work in 2018. Uh, 2019, we were invited back uh, to present another work re related to inequality, uh, and um, uh, Ex-Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was there as well. Uh, and this year, um, a new uh, development was that uh, we published a book um, in English and in French on the Poverty Line Project. Uh, this was with the support of the Luma Foundation and the All Red Contrast uh, Photography uh, Festival. Uh, and this book itself um, has a more extensive collection of the visual work uh, and also in-depth uh, insights that were contributed by economics and policy uh, experts, um, as you'll see here. And um, we were really honored um, that just uh, last week, uh, MoMA um, in New York um, actually uh, named our book as one of the favorite photo books of 2021. So certainly with um, this work, uh, we hope, we think that um, we, we, we need to push it um, to really engage more people and, and use art as a platform um, to be able to spur conversations uh, on issues related to poverty, inequality, our food systems, 
uh, and really understanding how do we change mindsets uh, and, and collaborate together in solving these issues. Thank you. Oh, Lynn, thank you so very much. It was a very detailed and comprehensive overview of how you started the progress and the exhibition. And of course, congratulations on being on the top 10 for MoMA. That's really exciting. And I did see the our exhibition um, on emails. Of course, I could not go this year, very sadly, as you know, no one can really travel. Um, but yes, we've actually installed your exhibition. I think you've seen the work as wallpapers and we've scaled the images to the exact size of a broadsheet so that the uh, the works are wrapped around uh, the walls in a paste up manner with the actual sizes. And then at the beginning of each of the country's photographs, we've done a singular page, which outlines, of course, the name of the country in their own currency, how much, and also relating it to the US dollar as well. So it's yes. been, you know, Beautiful. really exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's a really, really popular exhibition um, and deservedly so. And I think what's really interesting is the, the, what you've been discussing in terms of the relationship between arts and science and, of course, what then leads us to policy. And, you know, for many people actually seeing, uh, seeing, seeing the, 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 the crisis through a very simple informational photographic uh, project, long form photography, it just allows people to engage very easily rather than, I suppose, from an economics perspective of having, you know, large swathes of words in a book. So it just allows that sort of engagement. And I suppose that's what I'd also like to talk to you, Bernardo, about, which is the whole idea of how does policy uh, play a role in what you do at Oz Harvest? Um, and I suppose in light of this really stunning exhibition that, as Lynn has said, has actually ended up at the United Nations. So bravo. Hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I can't, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. That was so inspiring. I can't congratulate you enough for the work and the amount of hours that I'm sure went into uh, the research and the creation of this beautiful piece of work. Uh, congratulations and thank you for uh, shedding light into such an important issue. Um, on behalf of Oz Harvest, thank you. It is uh, food, food is Food is precious, right? So food is uh, food is essential. It is a uh, we believe that it is a human right, but more than that, we when you look at human history and human interaction in every event, in every human related interaction, you will find food is there somehow, and yet um, we live in such a wasteful um such a wasteful society in fact we waste 1.3 billion tons of food worldwide and um it, it it has three major major impacts uh an economic impact it has uh basically in australia it costs the australian economy close to 40 billion dollars a year um then there is also the environmental impact so you know food uh, it contributes food waste contributes to, to climate change in a significant manner that is often overlooked and of course the social impact we've got um we've got too too many people going hungry and we do produce enough food to feed everyone so to, to answer your question fiona in regards to policy uh, when we are looking at, um, at, at food at overall, we are looking at a very complex issue that requires a very, very holistic uh, approach. And one of the, I, I, say, I would say that policy is about 25% of that approach. Mm -hmm. um, I usually divide between uh, policy intervention, extensive policy intervention, local level collaboration and it needs to be i can't stress enough local because that's that's where the the real food system action actually comes from um education school-based and community education 
and definitely um, food initiatives. So on the ground, like food rescue or food relief initiatives that will tackle both food waste and food insecurity. And I think what's brilliant here uh, with, um, with Lynn is that uh, she touched on a, uh, they touched on a very, very great um, point for us, which is the very concept of food insecurity. When we talk, when we talk about food insecurity, people tend to not, uh, not even know what that means, you know, like, which is essentially um, when we look at the UN and what the UN has actually uh, outlined as, as the concept of food insecurity, is the lack of affordability or um, accessibility to nutritious food that is culturally and linguistically diverse appropriate. So that right for choice that Lynn has touched on, it's so critical when we, when we consider that and the, and the nutrition levels as well. So when we, when we think about food insecurity, we tend to think about hunger and, uh, you know, and, and, and people going hungry and people going, you know, we refer back to that rumbly sound of our, of our bellies, but it's not necessarily that, um, only that, it is much more than that. So it's the access to that nutritious food or to that mm. food that is appropriate for you to actually uh, mm. grow. And I think that's when policy comes in play in a, in a big way. Uh, at, in Australia, we do have the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, and in Victoria specifically, where we are, um, we have the the Victorian Food Basket. We uh, we lead at our harvest all our work. We do have KPIs, um, you know, the, our key performance indicators and our targets directly aligned with those policies that basically make sure that we're not only providing food out to people that it will just fill them up but uh, we will provide food to people with dignity mm. with the humane approach what uh, following the concept of the right to food i do believe everybody has a right to food basic human right food is a basic human right but it needs to be nutritious and appropriate so that's where mm. policy comes into play. Mm. Thank you so much, Bernard, for those Bernardo, for those incredible words of wisdom. Um, and I think that uh, Chow and Lin's uh, exhibition is very provocative in the truest positive sense. And I just wanted to ask you, Lynn, a little bit more detail about, you know, um, when you started realising that documentary photography was going to be the art form that you were both going to choose collaboratively to um, to talk about socially provocative work. Um, <laughs> that makes it sound um, very purposeful and planned, but it honestly wasn't <laughs> at the start. <laughs> I think um, we, we, we were just two people who came from different backgrounds, but were very much concerned about similar things. And we tried to understand it uh, first from our own ways. But as we spoke, as we discussed more, uh, we realized we, we wanted to build something together uh, and, and marry our 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 viewpoints in a way we thought was meaningful to 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 each of us um and and that's how we we started because um Stefan Chow uh he he was a photographer uh, he was a photographer and originally um a journalistic uh photographer uh photojournalist mm. uh and so for him you know very naturally uh the documentary form uh was appealing um but yet we we we, we wanted to also be different from a, a, a you know many of the um the the photo documentaries that um are really good um but focusing on the human story focusing on the living conditions uh and because for for me as a as a non photographer i think um sometimes you know uh and and also for as a ex uh, civil servant i think sometimes you know too much data um goes over our heads too much emotive emoji, Im imagery also goes over our heads mm -hmm. because it hits us. But then, you know, after the headline passes, um, do we? How much do we really think about it and and leave in our systems um, that that you know that that we want to continue uh, uh, engaging in in the topic? 
So I think um, we, we wanted to try a different approach. Uh, and, and so uh, we thought we, we want to use objects. Uh, and placing the objects on newspapers actually gives it a, a, a different meaning because then it also explains uh, newspapers are a local, uh, very much a local good. Uh, it's a local good, which is also very common to the public. Uh, and, and it's meant for a local audience. So it, it really reflects uh, the social concerns, the politics, uh, the celebrities, uh, uh, you know, commercials of the, the local society. Uh, and, so, and so that became um, actually another important element uh, of the work. Mm. Well, it's very, very, I mean, might I say it's very cool. You know, it's not um, trying to pull on heartstrings. And we know from... Um, many photographers that fly in and fly out of war-torn um, uh, countries when they're telling stories. It's, it's often um, quite emotive. Um, even, you know, ad campaigns for um, social enterprises often have the lonely child in the torn clothes uh, talking about hunger or poverty. And it's designed to, um, to, to engage with people's uh, emotions uh, and and try and get them to understand the story. But what I like about yours is that it, it moves away from those sort of heartstring, repetitive um, photographic narratives that we have seen a lot of really for the last 50 or 60 years. And it does take a very cool approach, somewhat scientific, if you like, in terms of the number of things on the newspaper being different and the number of objects, so that it's very easy for all ages and all abilities, can I say, to very simply understand that some have got more and some have got less, and perhaps all of them generally don't have enough. Yeah. So um, I think from that perspective, when I met with you and Stefan and we discussed your project and I invited you to exhibit. I think that was something that I was really interested in, which is a long form documentary that actually tells the story in a very different way. Um, so I suppose um, on that note, um, I thought I might just talk to you about some of the other projects that you also um, are involved in that we haven't exhibited. I know that we've been, we're doing the poverty line, but I thought the audience might be just interested perhaps in what you're working on right now. Right. Um, so we have also ex <laughs> um, we've expanded on our work. Um, so the poverty line was maybe a more, um, it, it was a, a first uh, collaboration for us. And, and I think, you know, you, 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 you rightly mentioned that it, it seems very scientific. Uh, and and maybe more documentary scientific um, than yeah than art, but um, it, I, I think the, the the I think the persistence and and the ability to build up that that whole visual language uh, kind of became our signature. Mm. Um, but we have also moved into more conceptual uh, artistic uh, formats, um, and uh, some of the topics that we look at basically are global tipping points, uh, and we we've, we've looked at the issue about uh, consumption about ecological sustainability of our food systems. Uh, we've also looked at um, refugee crisis, um, fake news, uh, and um, yeah, so quite varied, um, but I think generally a, a, about the concerns that we see, um, the, the, the big trends which are happening in the world, big data, the use of information and misinformation uh, and so on. And, and these are trends I think that um, really impact our social fabrics uh, and are also um, uh, kind of uh, challenging um, our, 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 our systems of governance, um, our systems of economics and, and financial exchanges. Uh, and uh, interesting because if they continue on, on the trend or, or the, the, the potential um, curve, uh, then they could really uh, pose as alternative um, um, you know, uh, structures uh, that, that really become um, very interesting, but also quite dangerous and, and uh, possibly we'll see more people being left behind. Uh, so so we, are, we are dealing with these kind of different issues. Um, so, uh, and, and really trying to see how do we understand the complexities uh, of these which are interrelated, um, but find a very human way uh, to associate uh, with, with, with these topics. 
Mm. I suppose uh, thinking about people who are being left behind, I think that Oz Harvest, um, I think you focus a lot on people who are, you know, marginalised and who are left behind. And I thought it might be lovely for you to be able to just give us some explanations or some narratives around the kind of work you do uh, with marginalised communities here in Australia. Definitely. Um, so in, in Australia, about 6 million people are food insecure. Um, when you're thinking about a country of 25 million people, that is quite alarming. Mm -hmm. That is quite shocking. Uh, I don't mean to... Um, you know, to, to be the, the, the typical charity that we were talking about that basically uh, talks about the doom and gloom. Oz Harvest is actually the opposite of that. So we're all about empowerment. Uh, so whilst we do recognize that giving someone a meal when they are, when they are um, um, in need in that moment, it, it is absolutely essential and, and heartwarming. Uh, our work goes way beyond that. So essentially, we are our, our mission statement is to run ourselves out of business. The way that we do it, we we have outreach programs, education programs, engagement programs that go much deeper than just giving someone a meal. Uh, that will guide them, being that uh, working with children on on food sustainability, food systems education, on skills training kitchen skills training. We're talking physical um, physical uh, skills, so how to feed themselves, how to use what they've got, how to reduce waste in their households, life-changing experiences that, you, that these children have. Like So, so these are curriculum-aligned mm -hmm. programs that are delivered in schools all across the country or working with uh, teenagers or young adults that are considered to be at risk giving them a certificate too in hospitality. So teaching them how to cook in a, in a more commercial sense that will actually give them a career pathway, make them feel included in society and get them uh, that sense of community. Um, maybe, and hopefully, and, and this is, uh, this, uh, it's one of the programs that I love the most. It has shown that it basically just when you give someone the opportunity, they will take it and grab it with both hands and make sure that uh, they move away from that. Or being that with uh, other other programs like, for example, our nutrition education and skills training programs, which essentially we go out to communities, breaking the stigma that it is cheaper for them to just go down the road and and grab a. Uh, uh, a fast food or a meal at the fast food or something like that. So we do, for example, have um, um, cookbooks and recipe books that basically are all under two dollars per portion. That will break that stigma and their high nutrition level and using ingredients that are largely available and seasonal. So basically. Uh, you know, that whole idea of uh, skilling up people and empowering people. So we come from that positive messaging instead of, uh, you know, that doom and gloom message that uh, people just get overwhelmed. The same way, uh, so this is from a social level and the same thing that we do with, uh, with uh, the environmental level or in the environmental stage as well in, in, in terms of food waste. Uh, people are... Uh, Absolutely, and this is what I love about this work as well with Lynn because it, it it's it's factual, it's real, it's informative, and it is positive and empowering. So basically, it makes you question your own habits, and making you question your own habits, you can you can start creating uh, changes, slight changes in your behavior that will make uh, you know food access, for example, more, um, a, a little bit easier and a little bit uh, more comprehensible. Mm. Well, I have to share that um, I have Fridge Friday, which is um, when all the food is taken out of the fridge that's getting old and mouldy and my children love it and we make food <laughs> with everything that's could potentially end up in the compost. Well, and, Fiona, and uh, I've uh, always encouraged my children to understand that Fridge Friday is a really good idea before you go to the markets on Saturday, so that there is nothing wasted. And it, sometimes it's frozen. You know, you cook it and then you freeze it, and then you take it to work during the week. And you know, so you telling the stories about how to empower people to 
I suppose, in a way, care for the food that they've bought so that they can actually cook the great food and then the, the nutrition and all those other things follow is, um, you know, they're little steps that they make big cultural change. Because the other thing that I think Lynn's probably not aware of and perhaps other audiences is that Oz Harvest did start very simply as a mechanism to reduce waste in uh, hospitality sectors. And I think what's really interesting, not dissimilar to the Biennale, when I came to the festival and we were just exhibiting photography, and then, you know, for me it was, well, how else can we impact in the community that we live? And so that was, you know, workshops, education programs, more documentary, more talks with photographers, working with marginalised communities here in Ballarat to do education programs. And I think this is something from what I can gather, Oz Harvest has developed quite quickly. How long have you been around and how quickly did you change from that initial, you know, we need to do something about waste to actually evolving into quite a holistic pro program? Well, we've been around for 17 years now. Mm. So when we first started, uh, Ronnie Khan, our CEO and mm. founder, <clears throat> she used to run a, a, an events company, a quite a large events company. Mm. And she used to see so much waste, especially from the events. The last thing that you want is to run out of food at an event, right? At an event or a wedding or a corporate event. So mm. what do you do? You over cater you get uh, much more than what you need to guarantee that guests are not going to go home hungry. And she, one day she got sick of it and she started, she decided to put an esky in the back of her car and literally just take it out to a, to a shelter afterwards. And in the first month, she moved over 4,000 meals in Sydney. That's when she realized that the problem was much deeper. And as she went in, it just snowballed from there. Mm -hmm. uh, not only, uh, you know, it's something that is hidden underneath the the layers of society in a way in in Australia. We don't really uh, have a, a clear view of the magnitude of the food waste problem in Australia. Mm -hmm. When we think about two and a half, two and a half million tons are wasted in households mm -hmm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's absolutely appalling. Mm -hmm. And um, and we don't, you know, like we don't, we don't really have an idea. It's not really visible to us. So mm -hmm. once Ronnie started developing Oz Harvest in those early years, it became quite evident that it required a lot more effort. And I tell you what, she hasn't saved any efforts in putting in the, the research. And we wanted to make, in, to make sure that all of our programs are, are very, very strong, um, mm -hmm. have, have very strong evidence base mm -hmm. and that we monitor the progress mm -hmm. going forward, not only from a waste perspective, not only from a, a, um, a social perspective, but also from an economic perspective. Because mm. on one hand, we've got the poverty line describing how little you can afford to eat. And on the other hand, you've got this explosion of food waste and yeah. I suppose uh, Lynn you know have you been looking at those two extremes as well and any other projects from your putting your economics hat on I mean you know as as poverty becomes greater food waste has also become greater you know it's kind of it's they're poles apart they don't connect and yet they there they are sitting there you know yes. as facts I, I I think it's for me, putting my power, my, my economics hat on, but um, it, it's really fascinating. I think we build up a system um, which is, you know, very economically driven, very finance driven um, to talk about the production and to talk about demand and supply, but in very different, very separate worlds from what is really on the ground. Uh, and that means that your supermarket shelves can never be empty. You're always going to have food, which is going to be expired because you can't, you, you, you just, you know, once you have a, a, a supermarket which doesn't have a certain product, uh, people are going to start wondering why, why is that so, right? Did it run out? Um, are they stopping production? Uh, is toilet paper going to be like massively undersupplied? 
Right. So, so I think, I think in, especially when the pandemic uh, hit us, I think then the breakdown of the food supply system really reminded us of, um, you know, how, how vulnerable is, 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 is our system? Uh, how have we constructed it? What is the logistics of, of getting food distributed? Uh, how is it packaged? Uh, how long does it last? And, and really, who needs it? Right, so we're talking food as a basic need, but um, you know it also needs to be contextualized as to what is the nutritional value, uh, how is it to be prepared, uh, what is the convenience of eating it. Um, certainly, when we look at the um, statistics uh, or we look at uh, understanding food budgets, we also saw you know food certainly takes up a much larger proportion of household expenditure for low income households mm. compared to high income households. Mm. Uh, and because uh, you just only need to eat so many eggs in a day, right? Whether you're rich or poor, uh, you can't be eating that many more eggs in a day. Maybe you can be eating wagyu beef, you can be eating premium salmon or, or caviar, um, but still there's only so much stomach you, you have. Right. So I think food becomes a, a, a very interesting uh, way to understand also how our current systems are failing. Uh, what are the gaps that we need to really plug uh, from a waste point of view, uh, from a distribution point of view, uh, from pricing uh, and, and supply systems. Uh, and, and that really talks about how it's we are, we are interconnected as a global system. Uh, some of it is locally produced and locally consumed. A lot of it is exported, a lot of it is imported. Things get stuck at the ports uh, and, and then, you know, uh, gets expired, right? So I think that there are different issues which are turning up today, especially in a pandemic crisis. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of discussion, particularly in our, in our part of the world, about food miles, of course, because... The first thing that happened in pandemic was that um, certain foods, certain products and foods could not be imported because of the yes. shutdown of, of, um, of, of travel. And uh, people started to really start considering food miles and, and, and how we eat and what we eat. And seasonality as well has become a very big topic, of course. You know, going back to my childhood where, you know, strawberries were only in summer. You know, we didn't right. expect to eat. I mean, I sound like an old lady, but really we never <laughs> expected to eat strawberries in winter. You know, we just didn't. We didn't, you know, it was just, it, it's a, it's a, it's just, you know, that reversal back is just a beautiful um, way to consider uh, that maybe there was some, I hate to say some opportunities of change during COVID, but there certainly, I think certainly was, whether it's going to continue or whether we're going to go back to, strawberries in winter again I don't really know but it's certainly I think food as they say for thought <laughs> yes. um, so I think now that it's we've only got 15 minutes left I think I might like to if it's all right with both of you panelists to just now open the floor there's quite a few questions and they're very interesting questions and I thought I would start off with the first question I mean you have in a way answered it but you know they might want more detail in the first question is, what is the main motivation for creating the poverty line? Was it investigation, aesthetics, creating a tool for education? Um, a combination. All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. When we talk about education, it was really educating ourselves. Um, that, that, was, that was the starting point. We didn't think we would be educating others. Um, but certainly we are very happy when our, our work is used now. Uh, we have given um, talks to uh, students all the way from primary school to university and, and, and onwards. Uh, so I think uh, in the education sphere, we, we hope, we hope it, it can be used more um, because it's certainly a topic that students, children can also very easily relate to. Um, we have seen the effect of um, parents bringing their children to the exhibition and really having a lot of talk about them uh, with them later on uh, and, and relating to the food they see at home and, and in their meals. Uh, so certainly education is something we do want, uh, want to, to, to engage with. Uh, and um, yeah, so it started uh, as a very simple uh, curiosity question, um, but we, we certainly hope for it to have much uh, larger engagement and outreach. Mm, thank you for that, Lynn. And the next question goes to you, Bernardo, which is a question very close to my heart, because uh, I think arts belongs everywhere in the world, in every sector, uh, and it should be far more far reaching. Uh, the question is, do you feel the arts can really benefit the causes 
of uh, the Oz Harvest supports. Well, absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> what else are you going to say in an arts talk, Bernardo? Well, no, no, but I would, you know, like I, I, uh, being absolute, absolutely honest, arts have been involved in every major human development and movement in history. The arts are such an important way of humans to express and communicate in, uh, in, in ways that we can't even describe. I am a musician by 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 trade as well. Like I started playing music from you know I've always been very connected to art, to the arts because some things there are some things that we just can't uh, even even when we can't say we can't say it. Sometimes we are not understood, and through art we are able to actually get that connection to make those connections, those so ingrained connections that. It makes us human. It really makes us human. Ha, uh, the arts make us human. And I think um, to create changes, so when it comes down to, to what Oz Harvest does, what we want to do is to create a major shift, a major shift in how we see food, how we value food, how we behave with food, to create more sustainable and resilient food systems, to, to change the concept from food miles, Fiona, from what you were saying of food miles, to food meters, to use mm -hmm. urban space to, to basically, to reduce the complexities of the food supply chain and use urban spaces to produce nutritious food that is freely and readily available to everyone. If we cut food waste worldwide by 25%, we completely eradicate hunger. Think mm. about that. Mm. Um, so, but we are in a world that essentially we are a, a growing population and we will reach 10 billion people in this planet by 2050. And we won't be able to feed everybody if we don't look at our food systems and we, if, uh, with a really magnifying glass and really create change, not only at, at the production level or, or the manufacturing level or the distribution mm -hmm. level or retail level or hospitality or, or institutions, but at households. When you're talking about the strawberries, Fiona, uh, these strawberries are just hitting those shelves because we demand that they hit those shelves. You know, we get to supermarkets, for for example, like we've worked with bakeries that have their, their they have policies to have their, their shelves stocked up up to 15 minutes before they close. But they don't do it by choice. If you talk to those bakers, they would be heartbroken to, to see their, their product of the sweat, blood and tears being thrown in a bin at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. They only do it because us as consumers, we expect it. And we need to really strengthen, uh, we need to somehow, we are running out of time and we need to make sure that that message sinks through all of us. We, you know, as, a, as I said before, food is a human right, but with every right comes a responsibility. And our re only responsibility is to respect food a lot more. We need to respect food, and that message needs to come through. And I think the arts is a great vehicle, uh, an, an, an amazing vehicle to, to get that message through. So that's why I was so emphatic in thanking Lynn at the, at the start of this talk about uh, for shedding light into this, in, into this matter, into this issue, because it is a large societal issue mm. and we, can't do, we need to do it together. We need to fix it together. And I think the arts as a communication vehicle, it couldn't get any better. Mm. And I think um, just adding to that, of course, is that, you know, a project like Poverty Line, when it travels around the world and we all see it and we all share it and it goes through social media, and it's so easy to understand and it is a very strong art form. When I explained that it was simple and not emotive, of course, it is a very significant art form that you do. It's beautiful. It just doesn't have that other, which I think is maybe a little bit tired. I think your kind of artistic, uh, artistic intent for me is perfect. Um, so I think that the movement around the world 
going to festivals, photographic festivals, where particularly, for, for example, in Arles, it's outdoor, which I think allows more audiences to what I call accidentally see it. So they're not looking yeah. for something in the white box. They're not just art goers. They're going to be walking past as part of their normal travel and see it on the wall. I saw that in Kochi in India. It was incredible, the outdoor there where local community members were looking at this art from other countries going, oh, what is this? And really engaging with the visuals. And I suppose on that note, the last question we have today is a question that we've already just spoken about, about AL in a different format, but they really wanna know the kind of format or design that you have exhibited this project in before and the different ways in the different places. So we saw one, of course, in the Beijing, uh, Beijing Biennale, which was kind of on an escalator. Look, like uh, it was actually a, a, a long pathway and it was along the whole, I think it was like over 10, 12, 15 meters. Yeah. So, so it's like in a on, public on, space or in a gallery? Uh, the uh, Central Academy of Fine Art Museum. Right. So it's an institution. Yes. Mm. Um, so we've 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 done different formats. So so we've exhibited this work probably in about 15 countries. Uh, and um, so we've done the large prints, as you saw, outdoor um, and, and uh, in rooms. Um, and we've also done one which was sticker paper. Um, so small and medium and large stickers. And that was mm. at PMQ in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, we actually also, so besides um, uh, exhibitions, we've also done workshops uh, where we got uh, participants to also go through the most, uh, you know, understanding given the budget, uh, how, how they go and purchase, uh, make their decisions on uh, from buying things at the market and, and coming back and, and, and assembling their own uh, works. Um, so, so many different formats of engaging with audiences. Um, so um, actually, yeah, so, so I think with the book, actually, it, it actually provides a, a different format again um, that we hope um, gives people a bit more in-depth um, engagement uh, when they choose to, um, because uh, an exhibition, you know, sometimes you are just so happen to pass by, uh, sometimes you go for a festival, but there are so many other works around, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it becomes also a transitory um, um, uh, phase of of. Of, of looking at our work. Uh, and we found that actually the, the book um, provides a different um, mindset when somebody takes a book off the shelf, uh, you know, you are really looking to, to read something and, and, and pay it a little bit mm. more. Mm. I think we've lost Lynn for a moment. Lynn, I don't know if you can hear me. Can Bernardo, can you hear me? I can hear um, intellectual uh, a lot of different type of engagement, more of a, 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 a bit more prolonged. Uh, We're oh, losing sorry. you, Lynn. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Only, Am I back? Only I back? bits and pieces. So what I wanted okay. to do was just show your book to the to the group. This is The Poverty Line. It's an incredibly extensive book using recycled paper, of course. I'm well, I'm, I know that because uh, I used to be a designer. No, it's, it's um, it, it's it's thin paper, which is almost like newspaper quality. But it's also, I think it, you'll find it's recycled, which is fantastic or reused, and it's got incredible detail. We are going to have this on our website for sale. It's a pre-order because we won't be able to have it till January with the publishers. But we're going to have a pre-order for people within Australia to purchase one of these because they're fantastic. It just, it's a fantastic book. And I suppose talking as we wrap up about education, I mean, both of you have talked quite a lot about edu education. And of course, we have a very large education program started in 2016 when I started and we had 700 students. And I was so incredibly excited to have 700 students. And now we're up to about five and a half, 6,000 students through our programs. And I think we can all agree that um, education for youth, absolutely, but all ages, can I say, is really important. And I hope, Lynn, that we can, uh, when the pandemic settles and everyone is vaccinated, double vaccinated, I'm hoping we can invite both of you to come and do some, some detailed workshops with our community here in Ballarat. I think that would be very exciting for our community and it would be very worthwhile. And of course, Bernardo, we would love to welcome you and Oz Harvest up to talk to us as well. 
So just to end the conversation, I'd like to, of course, thank you so much for joining this conversation, looking at the poverty line on a deeper level and the important work of Oz Harvest Australia. Thank you everyone for tuning in to the final, F final event of our conversations online series. All of our talks will be recorded and they're available in the coming week and you can view them on our website, Ballarat Photo, that's with an F, ballaratphoto.org. And for those wishing to visit the Biennale and Chow and Lin's exhibition in person, the festival has now been extended until the 9th of January, 2022. And you can purchase tickets through our website. We hope to welcome you to Ballarat soon. And thank you again, Lynn and Bernardo for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you.